Welcome, you're listening to the Renegade River Show. My name is Mike Hewitt, and today we're live in the studio with Congressman Bill Heisinger. Bill, welcome back to the Renegade River Show. Hey, good to be with you, Mike. Thanks for the opportunity. It's very, very nice to have you here, Bill. I've got a big, gigantic, plethora a uh, size list of things to ask you, but I wanted to start out with some just to get a feel for what's going on and, and both personally for you, uh, have you gotten used to the crazy schedule yet, Bill? Well, you know, having uh, having an opportunity to work for Peter Hookstra as his district director back uh, for a number of years, uh, I've worked for him for six years, uh, coming out of a real estate background and construction background. I wasn't anticipating originally doing that for six years, but turned into six years and then six years in the uh, in the state house uh, I think it was a, a, a good preparation uh, and frankly not only just for me but for my wife and our family uh, we had a taste of it but here's how I also describe it you can study bullfighting you can go to every bullfight that you can find but until you're actually standing uh, holding the cape with the bull charging at you you don't fully understand what it's like to be a bullfighter right uh, and um, you know actually Hookstra and I have had this conversation where uh, you know, you, you, you don't fully understand it until you're in it, and you know, you live sort of in two different places. Um, I spend half my time in Washington, half my time back here in West Michigan. I, you know, my family's still in Zealand, and I sleep, uh, I sleep in my office and, and those kinds of things, and uh, it, you, you, you try to make sure that you're remaining connected back home, and that's why you have good staff. and. Uh, that's why you have uh, a spouse who will uh, give it to you straight. You know, there's no sh there's no sugar coating it or candy coating it from Mrs. Isinga. And uh, but you need people like that in your life. Yeah, I got to tell you, I don't think you could even begin to think about doing that job without her support. Yeah, a absolutely. It's got it's, it's got to have turned her life upside down as much as it has yours. Yeah, and you know, and the kids uh, as well. And I, I'm not I'm not crying uh, crocodile tears. I mean, this was a job we volunteered for, uh, but. You know, people sometimes forget what the effects are on uh, on families. And look, you know, it's not a lifestyle for everybody. But neither is running a retail operation like Renegade River, or uh, being an airline pilot, or you know, being a plumber. And and we all have, are built differently. And uh, for whatever reason, God sort of made me that way. I find it interesting. We enjoy it. Uh, but uh, it is like climbing a never-ending mountain every day. You know, it's very, got to be. Very challenging. Tell me this, Bill. When, when you compare it to well, a couple things, when you compare the, the culture, at least from the outside looking in, it looks like the angst, the level of intensity is much greater now than it was, say, when you were working for uh, um, uh, Pete Hoekstra. Um, outside looking in, it yeah. looks like it's a different climate. Yeah, I, I would say yes, it is. Uh, but uh, we sometimes forget some of the difficult stuff that was happening uh, uh, back in Pete's day. Uh, NAFTA, uh, impeachment, uh, the uh, flag burning. Uh, right. Remember the flag burning amendments, oh, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, the, uh, Alien Gonzalez. Uh, there was a number of those things. And I think when people stop, they start going, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, I was really mad about Elian. I was, I was really mad about the flag burning. I was really mad about you know, the impeachment of the president. Um, so you know, we sort of uh, tend to to, to 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 look through that uh, narrow optic of where we're currently living in. But I'm a student of history, and uh, you look back and, and truly look at our history. Uh, you know, we have this notion that you know, it's sort of the founding fathers sat around and you know roasted marshmallows and sang kumbaya. Uh, the uh, the simple fact is is that it was very tough, very difficult, uh, and challenging, and personal. Uh, and you know, you go on to look at the uh, Civil War era, uh, the, the the debates over slavery, the you know the the debates of FDR packing the courts, uh, World War II. I mean, there's a there's a lot of times in our history, that, and so we'll be able to survive this too. It's just kind of tough. Oh, we'll get there. But when you when you talk on Civil War, just just a quick inset. Whenever they do a Civil War movie, I'm usually excited, but then, it, then it's the same battle. And <laughs> I, I genuinely love history. I wish they would show some of the drama that was going on in the, in the nation's capital yeah. and what was going on back home, um, the actual drama that led up to it and all of that, because it's a pretty fascinating story. But can I, can I, On that note, I just got done finishing a book that I would highly recommend. It's called Freedom's Cap. And uh, uh, Freedom's Cap was written uh, not that long ago. I think it was a year or two ago. And it's about the history of the uh, capital, all right? Uh, briefly talks about the first original capital, but the main focus is what led up to the expansion uh, where the current House of Representatives and the current Senate 
Uh, and the guy that was the main pusher, uh, the, the, the main cheerleader for this whole thing, and literally made sure that it happened, was none other than Jefferson Davis. The, you know, the slave-holding Mississippi senator sure. who ended up becoming president of the Confederacy was the guy that believed building the nation's capital uh, was a, 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 such an important symbol of unity uh, that he continued to push on it as a senator, as a secretary of war, uh, and then uh, later on, uh, when, uh, when he literally had to flee, uh, the guy that he worked most closely with was, um, was Montgomery Miggs, who ended up becoming the brigadier general uh, who, who was in charge of all the supply lines that beat the South. And uh, to have, to have those, two, uh, those two men work on something like that, and it's the whole lead up to the breaking up of, uh, or near breaking up of our country. And uh, so I highly recommend it. It's a fascinating book. Very, very interesting. Tell me, speaking about those kind of atmospheres, when you compare your experience as a state legislator to now in the, in the nation's capital, what's a, is there a different level of intensity? Is the angst between parties greater? What do you think the difference is, Yeah, I, uh, I always only half-jokingly say I'm living uh, Jennifer Granholm's third term. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's very similar. I feel like I'm trapped in Bill Murray's movie Groundhog Day sometimes. You know? Very smart person in the executive, um, <clears throat> articulate, well-liked, able to connect with people, um, but don't have the leadership skills and, and, and have not surround them with the people and they have no uh, themselves with the people that need to get it done and they have no relationship with the legislature. Uh, that was really, I think, one of the biggest knocks on Jennifer Granholm is, uh, you know, she, she was not able to relate. Neither is Barack Obama. And, uh, and it's not just, you know, my party, the Republican Party, uh, there's others in, in the Democrat Party that feel the same way. There, there's this disconnect. And uh, love them or hate them, uh, Bill Clinton had a very different way that he uh, that he operated with uh, with the legislature. Uh, it, it, same thing with uh, with Ronald Reagan. Uh, if you look at George Bush, he was uh, George W. Bush. He was known for having a cold relationship with the legislature, even when it was Republicans in charge. And sort of the same thing with uh, with Barack Obama, uh, with uh, with the Democrats in charge, and now obviously with the with the split government. Um, but uh, you know. Part of the difference, I think, in the intensity uh, is, uh, you know, the 24-hour news cycle, and they need to have a countdown clock to s doom for something. Sure. Uh, there's uh, everybody, you know, everybody is now a tracker with, uh, with cell phones. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, I, y you can't walk out of a restaurant sometimes in Washington, D.C. without someone sticking a camera in your face. Yeah, I think, I think the cable news system has changed that endlessly. But then you compare, I can't imagine, you know, we've heard stories and even seen pictures of Reagan and Tip O'Neill having dinner. Yeah. And I'm not seeing the Speaker of the House going into a casual cup of coffee with the President right now. Yeah, the, uh, I think the two golf games are about the extent of the warmth, you know, and, and it, it might be uh, Boehner and, uh, and Obama giving each other three-foot gimmies. Uh, that's, about <laughs> the, that's about the extent of the generosity of their, uh, of their relationship. But, you know, but it's also, uh, you know, within his own party. I mean, there's very few times that the president is reaching out and, uh, and, and trying to build those relationships, which is kind of ironic, having served a short period in the, in the Senate. Uh, but that was his reputation, if I ta talking to some of my colleagues who served with him in the, Michi in the, I'm sorry, in the Illinois uh, state legislature as well. I was just kind of who he was. He's very standoffish, and and uh, I think that's causing him some real problems right now because you're seeing this White House sort of come into a bunker mentality. And uh, when when you're in a bunker mentality, let's say Reagan sort of post Iran Contra, uh, uh, you know, George W. Bush in the latter parts, uh, Clinton post uh, post impeachment uh, have very much had that that timeline and it's not so it's not unusual in that second term but uh, we've now moved that up uh, you know just a few months into the second term and uh, they are in full-out bunker mode Wow tell me this you're on a you're on I think three committees uh, actually right? one committee one full a committee and two subcommittees uh, yes but yeah. your vice chair one of the subcommittees yes yep well tell me about the committee the financial services committee yeah that's pretty hefty uh, it is it's uh, it's considered one of the four quote-unquote, A committees uh, that are in Washington. 
Uh, the other, uh, the other three uh, are the Appropriations Committee. Now, I'm not sure why you'd want to throw yourself in front of that bus these days. <laughs> you know that that used to be the committee to be on because you could get all the goodies, right? Well, we've got earmark bans. We've got all, you know, on top of the fact that we don't have any money to to to, to spend. Um, uh, so it's it's a very difficult one, and. And this is really where a lot of the concentration of the fight's happening right now with Paul Ryan discussing with Patty Murray. Um, it, the appropriations process doesn't go through the way that it's supposed to. They haven't, had, they haven't had a budget process. I've never voted on a full budget in the three years that I've been there. Uh, and uh, it's been five years since the Senate has passed any kind of appropriations bills. Uh, and so everything's just going on in this continuing resolution, which is not how it was set up to do. But uh, to me, to me, Bill, that that's just an amazing thing. Even a little mom and pop operation like my store, yeah, we have a budget. And yeah, we know. I know what I'm going to be trying to spend on advertising next November. I, I mean, the idea that we're running something as mag, you know, huge as trillions of dollars. It's just yeah. an amazing thing to yeah. me. Well, and there's two parts to it. One, it's the budget. That's sort of the guideposts, all right? And that's like saying, okay, we're, we're going to have $75,000 to spend as a family, as an income this year. Great. Now how are you going to spend it? That's the appropriations process. That's when we're saying, okay, it's going to be this much for, the, for, our, for our mortgage, this much for clothing for the kids, this much for a vehicle, this much for, you know, picket, whatever, house maintenance, whatever it might be. And um, they, they hadn't done either of those till last year, and, and now uh, we finally have the sort of the overall number, but uh, we still don't have that specific, what are we doing in the Department of Defense? What are we doing in Veterans Affairs? What are we doing in the Department of Transportation? Uh, those specifics need to be done, and, and we, return, we want to return to that regular order. Uh, but, so we kind of got off on a little bit of a rabbit trail. The other, the other uh, committees... Uh, Energy and Commerce, which is chaired by Fred Upton, uh, Ways and Means, which is all the tax writing, uh, is uh, is chaired by uh, Dave Camp, uh, both from Michigan. And then the fourth, uh, quote unquote, A committee is uh, Financial Services, and we have oversight of all of uh, the credit unions and banks, insurance companies, all the enforcement uh, 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 entities, the you know the SEC, the FEC, the or not FEC, F FTFC. Uh, Federal Trade Commissions, uh, all of the different regulators that uh, that that look into it, and then of course the Fed, uh, and that's the subcommittee that I'm vice chair of, Monetary Policy and Trade, uh, and uh, fascinating and frustrating uh, all at the same time as we're seeing, you know, the stock market rally to sixteen thousand, uh, but it's not because we have such a healthy economy; it's because we've also created this artificially low interest rate environment here with quantitative easing um, where literally the government can't find any other customer other than itself right. to buy the bonds at the at the rate that they want to offer and uh, and we wonder why people are flooding into the stock market well it's because they're not getting the return on bonds the way they used to and uh, you know hey Wall Street doesn't care what carcass they're feeding on they just want a carcass sure all right and and so they're they're fleeing to that it seems though that there's a certain segment, certainly the executive branch, but even the media, that want to point to that stock market as a measurement of how the economy is in growth mode. Yeah, and it isn't. Trust me on this. I'm, I'm in retail. It's not in growth mode. Yeah, no, that, you're exactly right. And uh, you know, the same folks that are beating up on Wall Street and are saying that we can't take care of Wall Street, then are pointing to successes on Wall Street as somehow uh, a leading indicator that the economy is doing okay. And uh, it, you know, as I always say, we can't worry about Wall Street. We got to worry about Main Street. We got to make sure that you know people have enough money in their pockets so they can stop in at Rogue River, and uh, stop in at the local restaurant, and stop in at the local movie theater, and that they're going to tell their kids, yeah, I think it's okay that you go out and you know go roller skating or skiing or you know we're up here in Muskegon, you know, luging, whatever you know, whatever it might be. Um, and people don't have that confidence yet. No, they don't. But those things you just listed reminded me of two catchphrases. One is common sense, and the other one is tri trickle-down economics. Yeah. Because th it is what it is. But, hey, tell me about Obamacare. What's going on from your vantage point in the House? Wow. <laughs> this, this is an hour-long show, right? Yeah, yeah. The, uh, you know, okay, so here's, here's the issue. Uh, a lot of us, myself included, tried to warn of this. We, 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 we knew that this wouldn't work the way that it had been set up. And 
the irony is is that uh, the same folks that decided to ignore uh, the other side of the aisle in uh, in passing this are now saying to that other side of the aisle, uh, hey, um, why aren't you helping to implement it? Why aren't you helping to, uh, uh, to, to fix it? And it's like, well, okay, I mean, you sort of created this, uh, this, this problem yourself, and if you had listened and had tried to, to, to pass something in a bipartisan fashion, uh, maybe we would have had that. Not a single Republican vote in the House or in the Senate for, uh, for Obamacare. And, um, you know, that, that's, that's an issue uh, that uh, sort of underpins everything. But, you know, they can fix the website, and I suspect that they will eventually, even though they just admitted that now they still have to build the other 40% of it because they have no way of paying. I'm sure that's how Amazon.com uh, did it, right? You know, we're going to sell books, I but we're not going to have any way for people to pay for them. <laughs> yeah, gu I guarantee you this, Bill, if you go to RenegadeRiver.com, there is a payment acceptance process, okay? <laughs> you can buy whatever you want from my website, but bring your charge card. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, and it's like how... This is this is about is this is about as elementary as you can possibly get, uh, and um, you know. So eventually, though, they they may be able to fix the process of the way of the website. What they're not going to be able to fix is what the website's then telling people, and what the website is telling people. And if anybody saw uh, Friday, or I'm sorry, Thursday's Wall Street Journal, uh, there was a uh, quite a long editorial or a column by someone who who. Uh, whose mother, who was not wealthy, this was, a, this was a, a writer in New York, mother lived out in California, and uh, her mother was 52 years old, uh, had carried her own insurance, uh, was told that the one choice that she had was going to, uh, to triple her premium. Uh, when she went in to decide to you know, try to sign up, it actually kicked her off and said her one option is sign up for Medicaid. Okay, well, you know, that suddenly is uh, going to branch into another problem. Because I've sat in, in that chair in, in Lansing. And in Lansing, uh, the three biggest expenditures are corrections, uh, education, and Medicaid. And uh, that is going to grow. And we're, uh, we're seeing that burden potentially getting on uh, more on the states. And um, that is part of the problem, the way that they've got this set up. Do you think to those folks that think that they set it up this way on purpose to fail so that they can point us towards single payer? Yeah. Is that a reality or is that just a, what do you think? Uh, it's, it's hard to tell. I think that there are some people that, uh, uh, you know, they weren't satisfied. They did believe that they needed to jump right to the single payer system. Um, there's, uh, there's others that I think were trying to be half pregnant, right? They were, they were trying to go sort of part way. And uh, they're learning that it's uh, that it's not going to work. And I think then the really the decision is what direction do we go as we're responding to this? Are we going to go to a single payer system, or are we going to uh, are we going to pull back, uh, which uh, which is what I advocate? We're going to pull back and retool uh, and uh, and reform this. And there's a number of things that we put forward. The Republican Study Committee has a has an alternative health care bill. I'm a co-sponsor of uh, Dr. Tom Price. Uh, has a standalone that I'm a co-sponsor of. He's out of Georgia, He's originally from Michigan here. Uh, so we've got to just be able to do some, say something more than just no. Uh, we do have to offer alternatives, and we're trying to do that. It's amazing to me that the president wants to specifically blame the GOP for the failings of a program that the GOP absolutely was, aside from not voting for, he actually cut the GOP out. At least that's how it looks like oh, yeah. from the outside looking in. Yeah. Not only do I not want your vote, I don't need your vote, but I don't want your input either. Correct. And now that it's crashing around him, there's a picture on my Facebook page that shows a, a, big, uh, a big gigantic dog sitting on a couch that's been absolutely eaten up. I mean, there's nothing left of the, of the couch he's sitting on. And he's going, don't look at me. I don't know how this happened. Yeah. Okay. It kind of <laughs> reminds me a little bit of our, of our president on this topic. Yeah, so, it's, uh, it, it's, it's not been easy sledding for him. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, this is the atmosphere that he's helped create. And then he, then he feigns shock and surprise that uh, this is the atmosphere. Yeah, I, he couldn't have not known. Welcome back. You're listening to the Renegade River Show. My name is Mike Hewitt, and we are in the studio this morning with Congressman Bill Heisinger. Bill, welcome back. Hey, Mike. Thanks. Appreciate it. Um, tell me a little bit what's going on with NSA. 
Yeah, uh, great question. And uh, obviously something that uh, we're all struggling with. Excuse me. <clears throat> You know, here's my view. Uh, we've got to make sure that we have a robust protection of our personal uh, uh, individual rights. Uh, we need to have that. Uh, that's, that's not questionable. Um, the balance is, I think, where we're, where we're really struggling. And how do we make sure that we keep our personal individual rights intact while providing the security that we need as a country? And um, I, I do believe that we have gone too far uh, in, uh, in in some of the actions that have uh, that have taken place. Uh, you know, it's sort of this continuum. You know, it's a circle. The the philosophy of of, uh, of government. It's not linear. And now, when you start seeing the ACLU and me agreeing on a few things, I, I get myself nervous, right? Uh, but <clears throat> at the end of the day, uh, civil libertarian. Uh, as, a, as a civil libertarian, um, we've got to make sure that we protect those rights. Now, having said that, uh, is there a role for NSA or other entities uh, to go in and make sure that we are targeting folks who we know are trying to cause harm to the United States? Uh, yes, I think we need to do that. Do we need to tighten up the programs that have been put in place? I think we do need to tighten those up. Uh, do we need to make them all go away? Uh, no, I think that that would be a mistake uh, uh, as well because at that point then there, it's just free reign uh, uh, for people to, to coordinate and start looking at how they're going to attack uh, not just you know government buildings for say, you know, let's say, but how are they going to attack the New York Stock Exchange or the Chicago Board of Trade? Or how are they going to attack, uh, you know, every credit card processing firm, and uh, and uh, that that could cause huge r havoc within our financial uh, markets. What about when they're attacking power plants and, and those kinds of things? So we've got to have a cooperative, and that's the key word, a cooperative, voluntary uh, uh, process that's going to allow the government and the private sector to talk and uh, and to make sure that uh, we're not missing things. It seems, Bill, again from the outside looking in, it seems that some of these institutions within government, like NSA, have gotten so big that frankly nobody can control them. It reminds me a little bit of Hale from the, uh, the Space Odyssey 2001 movie where you got this computer that's out of control. It reminds me a little bit of that where NSA can't be controlled, can't be real done enough to strike that balance. Um, am I wrong? Yeah, I, I, I hope so. I, I, I believe that they can be. Um, it's uh, it's going to take some diligence, uh, but you know, you've got to assert yourself not only uh, politically, but in in the courts, uh, whether it's in the FISA courts or whether it, it, which are which are the uh, you know the the non-public side of uh, of the courts. I think what they're doing, trying to open up that process to let more of us see into it. Uh, and those of us who have been elected have a certain responsibility, but we also have, frankly, a, a responsibility at times to keep our mouths shut. Oh, and absolutely agree with that. You know, I mean, it's it's the old adage from World War II. You know, my dad's a disabled World War II vet, and uh, you know, the the loose sh loose lips sink ships. And when uh, when we've got folks out there uh, who are uh, exposing uh, uh, things and people when they when they shouldn't be. Uh, that uh, when they've been, that when they've frankly agreed not to, uh, that is uh, that's problematic, and there and there are processes to go through, and, I, and there's a huge debate about Snowden, right? Uh, I don't think that he's a hero. Uh, do I think that uh, he brought some uh, focus in on a on an issue that needed some focus? Uh, yes, but there were other there were other avenues that he could have taken. Uh, without going to a foreign correspondent at a foreign you know, <laughs> newspaper uh, to expose them, and all you got to do is turn on any of the cable shows, and you'll see, you know, members of the Senate or members of the House that uh, that are critical that that, that could have been that buffer that could have been going in, and uh, um, you know, that he didn't, he chose not to do that, obviously. Well, two things on on the NSA part, the part that concerns me most about them, we can certainly, you know go over the, the, the nuances of oversight for them. 
What what concerns me most is that a lot of those folks don't think they did something wrong. Yeah. So if I get pulled over going 90 miles an hour on the road, I know I'm wrong. I, and when, when when the officer walks up to the car, I'm wrong. Write me up. I understand. That doesn't seem to be their state of mind. And so that that's concerning. But in regard to Snowden, in fact, I just had a conversation about this fellow yesterday with a, um, a pretty, pretty strong-hearted libertarian. And of course, we're at odds. I think he's, to your point, I think exactly that he's a little bit, a little bit villain, and he's, and he's, in my mind, he's certainly no hero. But, but on the other hand, he did provide some light on some of these topics that needed yeah. needed to find light. But yeah, so, I, I just think it could, he could have done that differently. You know, getting hired in by a Russian tech agency after you've, uh, you know, after you've somehow gotten the uh, Vladimir Putin government to agree to keep, let you stay in the country. That does not exactly uh, make me feel warm and fuzzy about what he did. I mean, that that obviously he had information that China wanted. He had information that Russia wants. He had information that enemies of the United States uh, wanted and were willing to pay for, uh, one way or the other. And uh, you know that is uh, that is uh, that is I think going to 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 go down as probably one of the more damaging things. Uh, while it was, uh, while there were some positives coming out of it, there was a whole lot of damage that was done as well. Yeah, I, I don't. Th- it wasn't net zero; it was negative. Yeah. Um, but I will tell you the funny part about him, if there's a funny part, is that while he's talking about the fact he's uh, he's a, uh, you know, freeing our informations and bringing some light on things that will help make America better. If you look at the countries that he chose to <laughs> to go to, yeah. you go, you're not a freedom lover. You're wanting to go to the most hardline socialist nations in the world yeah yeah there yeah, lots of internet freedom in china yeah, as they shut that down <laughs> on a daily basis and you know not to mention tibet and uh you know fulong gong and a number of other places i mean th- that that is the interesting thing is he he has chosen to go to uh, to countries that not only are the antithesis of what uh of what our founding was all about uh they they are actually hostile to it and 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 enemies of that and uh, that that's not a consistency. No, that that as at that as that story unfolded, that part got to worry. Anyone actually paying attention had to push back a little bit, even if they were hardline civil libertarians. Yeah. Tell me this: if we can put a political hat on for a minute, looking forward to the next election cycle. Yeah. How do you think the Republican Party is going to do? Tell me who the candidate's going to be, and I'll tell you how they're going to do. You know that I think that's the uh, that's that's one of the main issues. Well, you're you're right, but I'm I'm only looking to the next midterm round, sure. and I'm wondering with that if there's do you think that there's a um, there was certainly a negative cloud that hung over the GOP for a little while, and it feels like that's been lifted. Um, it feels if nothing else has been shifted, now Obama's wearing it. Yeah. So that makes me feel like we may have a chance at the Senate. Yeah, I think that I, I think that second part is probably uh, probably accurate, Mike. Uh, I'm not sure that it's anything that we did so much as uh, it, it kind of caught up with the Obama administration. And when, frankly, when he uh, has a violation of the public's trust the way that he did. Uh, if you like your health care plan, you can keep it. If you like your doctor, you can keep them. Uh, it, it, that the American people feel betrayed about. And if you look back, and again, in history, any time there's a presidency that has lost that fundamental trust element with, uh, with the public, um, there's a price to pay. Uh, I can tell you, he is raising money for the DCCC like there is no tomorrow. Uh, the Republicans have been setting uh, fundraising records, and he's been raising 50% more again. Uh, the Democrats have more cash on hand uh, uh, through the DCCC than uh, the NRCC does. Um, they're, they're in October alone, uh, they raised $3 million uh, for the month of October while we were in, uh, while we were in shutdown. And uh, it... it I would suspect our next uh, their next reporting will show though that that has uh, that has uh, trickled or at least slowed but there's a tremendous power that comes with uh, with with that and uh, you know, the the thinking is though that the president has overplayed his hand Harry Reid pretty clearly has overplayed his hand and now what we saw at the end of uh, at, at the end of the last week here um, them going to the nuclear option and and shutting down uh, the opportunity for uh, uh, for the minority party to have a voice 
which ironically uh, Senator Obama at the time in 2005 uh, decried on the uh, on the Senate floor uh, as uh, as uh, as a violation. I mean, this is violating 200 years of uh, of rules that the Senate has operated under. Um, that is uh, that's certainly not setting uh, setting Harry Reid up for electoral success, and that's why you have people like Mary Landrew and Mark Pryor in uh, in Arkansas and. Uh, you know, Joe Manchin in West Virginia and a number of others just kind of running for the hills. True, they're jumping ship. Yeah, I mean, they, they're they looking at it and they're hearing people back home and they're saying, okay, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is not the direction that the president promised. It's not the direction that I promised people. And, uh, you know, sort of Harry Reid's uh, damn the torpedoes full steam ahead uh, attitude about this. I mean, the, they're having a debate that's raging right now within their own party. There's one element that says, this is just a storm we have to ride out. This is going to be rocky for a while, but people will embrace the, out, the final outcome. And then there's others going, uh, yeah, people feel lied to. Uh, they feel like they got deceived, and uh, they're not going to forget this, and I'm not going to pay that political price. I'm done standing next to you shoulder to shoulder on this, because every time they turn around, uh, they feel like the uh, the administration has walked away from them. So uh, that's uh, that's going to be a fascinating one to watch. The interesting part about all of that, if if you look at the the train wreck that is Obamacare, at least at this point, and then you look at Harry Reid's recent action with, it's almost doubling down on negative. Yeah. Um, it, it, you know that's that's some standing rules that had it lasted through a civil war, which was one of the reasons when we started this this morning. I wanted to know what the general. So, what, what's the feeling in, yeah. in D.C.? Because I think if we're stripping away um, rules that have been placed and lasted through a civil war, it must be pretty ugly down there. Yeah, it's it's pretty poisonous. You know, and, and, and the big difference is, is Mike, you, you know this, uh, whether it's in your own family, whether it's at church, whether it's at, in your business, uh, you have to have relationships. Because out of those relationships, trust gets built. And if there's no relationship, there's really no ability to have trust. And, um, you know, good or bad, the, the atmosphere is different. It used to be that people would, like myself, would get elected. We'd move our families out to Washington. Uh, we, that would kind of become home. Uh, the people that were uh, political adversaries would uh, be the same ones that you would see at the grocery store or your kids played on the Little League team or whatever, and you, you had a chance to build a relationship. And even though you uh, were disagreeing, uh, you had an, a trust element, and that's sort of the Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill element, right? Uh, Jerry Ford had that uh, uh, as well when he became president, and, and uh, uh, the, the difference is, though, now, um, and again, it's not good or bad, uh, it's just different, and expectations are different. Now, vast majority of us uh, have the ability to travel, uh, you know, I fly, I flew home last night. Uh, or you know, and and, uh, and I'm I'm off on uh, off in the district the next day, and uh, you know we we've got air travel and you know, different ways that we uh, that we can be communicating, and uh, that is uh, uh, that has definitely changed the tone and tenor uh, in Washington. Seems to me if two people can if you've got two honest people and they vehemently disagree on a topic, but they're both honest. They can sit down and, and, and cause communication until there's a resolution. Yeah. But when you don't have two honest people or you don't have communication or perhaps sometimes neither, then it's only going to get uglier. Yeah, that, that's right. And, and hey, we, we both have friends that believe we shouldn't even be sitting down having the conversation, right? Right. And I hear it, and, uh, and, and I, try to, I, I try to ask them. I say, okay, well, then how am I supposed to figure out whether I agree with this person on 5% or 15% or 50%? And even if it is only 5%, if I'm not talking to them and if I don't have a relationship with them, um, how, are we supposed to, uh, how are we supposed to figure out what we can possibly agree on? And um, I, I'm, I'm one that believes we need a government that works. I think it's too big. I think it's, it's too cumbersome. I think it's too intrusive. Uh, but I also want it to work. I don't think that uh, burning it down to the ground and starting over and sort of having this Lord of the Flies view of the world is is uh, is really positive. And but there are some folks out there uh, who uh, who do believe that that is uh, that is the right direction to go. I just don't think ultimately that's that's uh, productive. I'll tell you, I'm I'm writing a second book, and part of part of doing that is research. 
and and I loved uh, you mentioned history. I absolutely love history. But if you do things like get on the internet, I'll type in. I'm just looking for what thoughts are out, out there in the blogosphere, if you will. Yeah. You type in Second Civil War, and and then count the extreme right and the extreme left. The vitriol on the extreme left calling for that kind of resolution, if you can call that a, yeah. It's two or three times more than the extreme right, and the things that they're saying are just over the top. Yeah. It's a fascinating thing that we've got going right now that's got to be stopped, in my view. Yeah. But I thoroughly agree. We can't strip it down to nothing and start over. So we've got to say a lot of this works. Let's look at what doesn't and fix it. Well, and I think how you, here's how you fix it. You have strong, you have strong governors, uh, you know, like a John Kasich and a Scott Walker and, 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 and uh, people like that who are going to say, no, no, we have to reassert ourselves as states. And uh, we need to make sure that, uh, that our fingerprints and our imprint is, is being put on this. And not just allow the, uh, the 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 federal government to sort of reign supreme. That was not how we were set up. Now there's been, you know, time and time again, you know, going back to court cases and uh, you know different actions that have been taken, especially in this last century, starting about 1913, and uh, in in moving forward uh, with the with the Great Depression and some of the programs that were put in place there, and uh, you know one of the of course one of the banes of uh, of uh, freedom-loving uh, uh, folks around the world, uh, air conditioning. Uh, when uh, when air conditioning came to Washington D.C., they just they had the ability to expand the time that people could be in government. You know, we laugh about it, but that is that is uh, you know the, between the world wars and uh, and air conditioning, uh, Washington D.C. was unbearable. That would get they'd get people out of there, and uh, they would they would leave. Uh, and uh, as I always joke, you know, people say, "Oh, you're you're back from Washington." I say, "Yeah, you're safer now. Uh, it's, it's you can't screw something up when you're when uh, when we're not there." Uh, and uh, I've said that a lot, Bill. I'm yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, hey, I I agree with it. Uh, you know, we the, the problem is is we don't have a partisan divide so much as we have a philosophical divide. The proper size, role, and scope of government. You know, uh, pick it. The stimulus would have only worked if we had doubled the size of it. Or, you know, maybe it would be about right where we're at if we had spent half as much and put right. half as much on the credit card and our kids' future and, 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 and the mountain of debt that, that's on them. You know, Pickett, TARP, Wall Street bailouts, auto bailouts, you know, all the different things uh, that, we're, that we're going through. And uh, health care is, is sort of front and center. Dodd-Frank, what I deal with is, uh, is uh, much of those same things. And, that's the struggle that we're really dealing with now. And, and getting to your question about who's going to win elections, I think it's those that are going to be able to articulate that philosophy, and uh, they have to have some people that are willing to accept that. I think sometimes on our side of the fence, my side, the Republican side, there's a feeling that there's so much angst within the party. But that, And that may be true. I think good debate is healthy. But I think we forget sometimes, and you pointed it out earlier, the Democrats are going through the same thing. They've, they've got a, perhaps even more divide uh, within their own ranks now um, with the help of uh, President Obama. So I, I, th I think we're going to do, do just fine if we, uh, if we keep marching forward. Yeah, and I think that's what people are looking for is they're, uh, they're looking for progress. Um, I'm not satisfied. Uh, it's not uh, it's not fully the way that Bill Heisinga would like to see it uh, running, but guess what? Bill Heisinga isn't king. Uh, we're not meant to be that way. Uh, and uh, in a divided government, we've got to figure out a way how we're uh, we're going to make this function and work. Very very nice, Bill. Again, thank you very very right. much for coming on the show this morning. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. I look forward Good to having you on again. All right. Welcome back. You're listening to the Renegade River Show. My name is Mike Hewitt, and we're going to spend just the last few minutes of the show today looking at what's in the news. The very first thing I wanted to talk about is a little bit of picking up where we left off with Congressman Bill Heisinger, and that was the Senate knockout game. I don't know if you folks are following it, but what they did was truly, truly unprecedented. 230-some uh, years. They, the interesting part about it is the interesting part about it is, is that the Democrat Party claims themselves as being the party of uh, of Jefferson. He penned that, and that's okay with them. That's gone. It's just they've turned it into yesterday's news. What it actually does, though, it has little to do with the Senate and a lot to do with the transference of power. This gives the executive branch 
a little bit more power. They've taken away the debate process that, frankly, made the difference in the Senate from the House. The House can the House can take reactionary action. The Senate was specifically designed to move slower, to have debate, to to have the angst that we see, so that we didn't we we didn't have a legislative action look like a pinball machine hopping from one new rule to the next based on whatever the the news of the time was. That's washed away. That th- this is a precedent that won't stop here. It's going to go on to Supreme Court picks. It's going to go on to a lot of other things. It'll go on to the general process, keeping in mind that this is still a government that doesn't, as as Bill Heisinger and I talked about, this is a government that still doesn't even have a budget five years later. And like I said to Bill Heisinger, even a little a little country store like Ren- um, uh, the Renegade River, even we have a budget. The idea that a, that a, a government as large as we have would slow debate purposely cause less debate while not having a budget. These are all, to me, these are all train wreck issues that have absolutely got us pointed in the wrong direction. It's the same thing as Obamacare itself. We sit down and try to fathom the real reason that it's where it's at. On one hand, I say to myself, can all of those smart people, and truly we know they're smart, we don't have to agree with them, we know they're very well educated, they're, they're, most of them are experienced, and yet they created a process twofold. First off, the actual internet process. I mean, again, Ron, rene, renegaderiver.com is functioning. It can take payments. You can you can pick out one of 700 products. I, I can't imagine that this was so difficult that three years of planning it couldn't get done. So I say, okay, was it purposeful or are they really that arrogant that each month they thought, well, we'll get it done. We've got four months left. We'll get it done. We've got three months left. And of course, here we are and we learn that the payment side of it isn't even complete. But set that debate aside for a moment. Could that same group of, of the highly educated people look at Obamacare, that's what was the, uh, I, think the, the I think the actual law stood seven foot two inches tall when you stacked up the papers. How could they think that that was possibly going to work? And if they didn't think it was going to work, what were they really trying to do? Because they're, they, they're not that stupid. I just, I can't, I can't fathom what they were thinking, but the greater thing is, is how can it be stopped? And not just to Bill Heisinger's point, not just to say no, but to say we need to do something differently. We need to offer a difference. My my position all along has been, what was the actual goal of the average person? To me, I think t- we've talked with Oscar before. To me, he said uh, he couldn't get coverage. He was turned down because of pre-existing condition. If that's truly what we were trying to get at, then we needed to come up with a law that dealt with that. We needed to come up with a process. It could have been one of two things. Either he can't be rejected or there's a pool for him to go to, or if he brings in, just as an example, three rejection letters. Okay, now you're part of Medicaid or Medicare. Their choice. I'm saying these things because the things that they're pointing to as what their agenda was are all solvable without reinventing our health care system. And again, they're smarter than that, which causes me to say, that's obvious, so what were they really doing? I maintain what I said. I think they're trying to get us to point towards a single-payer, Soviet-style, not Canadian-style, Soviet-style healthcare system. Um, I remember when we had Jana Konechi on, and uh, she was here for an hour. She spent the first two segments telling me about, first, what it was like to be raised in the Soviet Union. Secondly, uh, what, what, what it was like to be educated and to be an adult in the Soviet Union and what the health care was in the Soviet Union. And in the third segment, I said, okay, Jana, now that we've gone through, you've been here, you've been here since 1992, tell us what you're seeing in America. And she said, that's what I've been telling you for the last two segments. Folks, it's a scary thing. So you've got to get involved. You've got to pay attention. That's my view. Because none of the things that our government says that they're doing, I shouldn't say that. That's big sweeping. The things that, for instance, with Obamacare, with NSA, those things don't make sense if we just sit and look at what they're saying they're trying to do. They're not that stupid. They can't possibly be that stupid, which causes us to say, what's the real agenda? If the NSA, if the goal is to protect us, you don't need to listen to me to protect us. I'm on the air every week. You can go into my store. So who's listening to my phone calls and grabbing my emails? Some of these things are over the top with the defiance of common sense, in my view. Um, Afghanistan rebuffs U.S. demand on signing security deal. So I think, wait a minute. We save them 
from their own internal debacle with a very, very aggressive war regime, and now they're going to dictate to us what I, while we're sending them billions of dollars every year. And I think you guys are right, absolutely right. You're a sovereign society, sovereign nation. We respect that. So we're going to take our folks and our money and go home. That's what I think we should do. Absolutely. I mean, the people that the people that uh, that caused the uh, the World Trade Centers to fall, that that did the terrorist attacks, most of those people are dead. They're certainly not in command positions anymore. That means our mission's been done. And if if the Afghans think that we should go, I'm with them. We should go. New York Times hails return of democracy to the Senate. Now, the problem with that is, folks, is that um, we're not a democracy. We're a republic. That's what they don't get. And the Senate wasn't supposed to be democracy. It was supposed to be where we slowed down, like I mentioned. Scientists witness massive gamma ray burst. They don't understand it. Um, makes me the very first thing I thought of when I read that headline is global warming. Because all of the planets in our solar system experienced global warming. Makes me think that it's the sun and not my Jeep. I'm just, just pointing it out. I don't think my Jeep did that. Loud cell phone talkers next ban for air travelers. Um, I remember years ago when they first came up with all the cigarette bans and there was a bunch of happy people about that and clapping. I said, that's okay. I certainly understand the motive, but be careful what you ask for because when we're empowering government to do that, they will never stop. There will always be another pet peeve or something that some do-gooder somewhere just had to stop. That's the problem. They went from cigarettes to telling you how much you can eat. Now it's where, when, and how you can talk on your phones. And by the way, we're not talking about just driving. Common sense is not, not <laughs> that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about how can they stop you doing things that bother them. That's what we're really talking about. I, I, our founders will be amazed. Absolutely amazed. Chicago Land, man found dead in police station restroom. The Chicago Land, for a place that doesn't have guns, sure has a lot of gun violence. <clears throat> that just is an amazing thing. Whenever I see news from Chicago Land, it's always about somebody dying. Ninety-nine percent of the time, it's at the hands of a, of a of a shooter in a community that they don't have guns. They got the strongest gun laws in America. It makes me think that. Well, reminds me a little bit of the Soviet Union. I'm sorry, Russia. Soviet Union is not there no more. Reminds me a little bit of Russia, where they have no guns to speak of. To, to own a firearm in Russia is a huge, huge process. And so they've got very minimal guns, but they've got five times the murder rate that we have in the United States. And that reminds me of Chicago. It's the same kind of ideology that dictates the controls of both. And it has the same exact end result. These things can't be coincidences in my book. Bloomberg will will third well, I'm sorry will 3D print human heart within a decade. So they think that they're going to you remember the big the big hula during the summertime when they were they were making plastic um, firearms from printers. Um, and now that same technology is evidently according to Bloomberg, who's a nut by the way, is uh, they're going to make body parts hearts evidently. I'm reading for uh, I'm reading headlines on the Drudge Report. And five minutes of reading these headlines is a really depressing experience. you got to be careful. So I try to skip through the ones that aren't so much and get to the ones that are. Man steals FedEx truck. I don't know what you do with a FedEx truck. It's not like you can sneak away and not be recognized. Scientists develop cheese from human feet. I'm not going to click on that link. <laughs> I don't want to know. French weather girl stuns viewers with nude report. Um, that sounds like Francais. Absolutely does. Man attacks pregnant sister over chicken nuggets. There was just what was that? Just recently, there was a some big aggression over oh a murder, local murder in a in a, uh, in a jail where one of the inmates wanted the lights off at night and the other one wanted the lights on at night, and so one of them killed the other with a bag filled with with asphalt. Evidently, he was using the, we the turned it into a weapon and beat the other guy to death. What a great place. Currency craze spawns Bitcoin wannabes. Have you folks been following the Bitcoin thing? That is getting big globally. Absolutely huge. And there's a lot of big time people taking, uh, when I say big time people, people with a bunch of money getting themselves very, very well uh, uh, invested in that. Man boards California bus with dead child. I don't understand. I don't. 
teen mysteriously becomes musical prodigy after suffering concussion. That stuff doesn't happen to me. I just forget what I'm talking about. Folks, we're going to be here next Sunday. We'll see you at high noon. Thank you very much for listening today. We'll see you then.